Hello, thanks for downloading this Royal Society video podcast. I'm here at the University of East Anglia in Norwich to talk to Dr. Michael Wormstone. He has guest edited a theme issue of Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B. This issue is about the ocular lens as a classic model for development, physiology and disease. So Michael, in your introduction to the issue, you describe the lens as the sparkling jewel of anatomy. Why is that? Well, it's a wonderful tissue. And first of all, I probably should just give you a few little tastes about the lens. So first of all, it's got no blood supply. It also has no nerves. And it receives all its nutrients from the fluids in the eye that bathe it. And it's enveloped by a collagen capsule matrix. And on the front surface, the anterior capsule is lined by a layer of epithelial cells. And at the periphery of this uh, coverage, these cells divide and differentiate into lens fibre cells. And these form the bulk of the lens and appear like layers of an onion, forming the mass. And the, th the reason why it's a sparkling jewel is because within this cellular framework, it's so ordered and precise that it simply looks like a little diamond within the eye. And it's this order that is critical to maintain its function, which is to stay transparent, allow light, light pass through it, and focus upon the retina. And it's any disorder associated with this organisation that results in problems, namely cataract. So the theme issues divided into three sections. The first section is the lens's model for development. So can you tell me more about that? Yes. The lens has always been a classical model for development. Again, because it's got very defined stages. It's a clear definition as to what happens and when. So consequently, manipulation at the molecular level can predict how things will change. Again, it allows you to identify what are the key factors involved in those various processes. So it becomes an excellent way of understanding how a tissue is formed. The issue then moves on to the structure and ultrastructure of the adult lens, and the lens is a model for solute exchange and homeostasis. Can you tell me more about that? Essentially, it all comes back to this order concept. The lens has to work together. The cells within the lens have to work together. So rather than thinking of each cell as an individual entity, the lens really does work almost like a commune. So there's communication across the entire lens, at the electrical level, at the physical level, okay, such that within e between each cell, there's a lot of communication in terms of gap junctions and tight junctions to allow solutes, for example, to, to pass through. Electrically, they're coupled. If you were to put an electrode in the lens epithelium, an electrode in the back of the lens, you can obtain a voltage indicating that all the cells are communicating. If each cell within the lens is important, failure of any component can result in problems to the lens. And that's where the ultrastructure and solute transport, etc., come into it. It's vital that these solutes and, uh, are, are transported effectively across the lens to where they need to be. Same with nutrients. So essentially that component of the, um, of the issue describes how we can actually examine this communication, how we can create order in our structure to allow light to pass through effectively. And therefore this, this key subtlety that defines this pure sense of, of organisation that maintains function. And could you outline the final part of the issue, which includes articles about the lens as a model for pathology, including normal and pathological ageing? Yes, ageing is a major risk factor for cataract. Essentially, the longer we live, the more likely we are to get cataract. And if we live to 100 years old, there's a fantastic chance that we will have cataract. And this becomes an even greater problem when we consider that the longevity is expected to rise dramatically over the next century. So it is key for us to understand the role of ageing in this process. As we age, the lens becomes gradually yellower, then browner, and can even become black. Right. 
when that, when that uh, brunescence becomes so great, it will occlude light, and that is really what we define as a nuclear cataract. Now, the trouble is, you can't actually reverse that process. So the only treatment at the moment is surgery. And if you consider that cataract is responsible for rendering tens of millions blind, cataract surgery is estimated to be more than 10 million operations per annum. So it's the most common procedure in the world. Unfortunately, that's not the end of it all. Following surgery, you entirely leave uh, a proportion of the anterior capsule and the entire posterior capsule, and this has allowed you to implant an intraocular lens, an artificial lens, to restore visual power. Unfortunately, there are some of the cells, the lens epithelial cells, remain, and these are capable of growing across all available surfaces, but most importantly of all, across the visual axis. They encroach across the back of the posterior capsule into the visual axis, and they cause deformation of fibrosis in that region. And this can cause light scatter. And this causes visual deterioration requiring secondary surgery within a few years of, of, of the operation. You're actually the author of the last article in the issue, which is called The Lens as a Model for Fibrotic Disease. So what is fibrosis, and why is the lens an elegant model for studying it? Well, fibrosis is a general term which really involves an excessive production of matrix that reduces the physiological function of a tissue or organ. And consequently, this can, lead to either, uh, can even lead to death. The lens is a fantastic model to study this for a number of reasons. One, that actually there are fibrotic conditions of the lens, namely anterior subcapsular cataract and posterior capsular pacification, the latter arising following cataract surgery. Also, the, the anatomy and the, the very traits of the, the lens that make it unique, its isolation, the fact it's not got a blood system, it's not got innovation, you've got these defined, cell, uh, defined cells. So consequently, we can look at fibrotic events in relation to these clinical conditions, and we can see what can mimic those clinical conditions, what can mimic the events in fibrosis. So again, we've got this very defined. Moving on to a more general topic, the ocular lens is a model which is of relevance to other fields. Can you give me some examples of these? Yeah, the, the lens is a fantastic model for ageing. There's a, a nice link between uh, mortality and cataract. So the incidence of cataract does predict mortality. Also, you know, some of the factors that contribute to cataract, such as oxidative stress, UV, etc. These have relevance to other systems. If we can understand the basic mechanisms of how these, uh, these stresses influence cells and how they can be managed, that has whole body implications. So what does the future hold for the ocular lens? The ocular lens is definitely a proven system to understand a number of biological aspects. And I can only see its value gaining. We have links from human through to genetic models. It's got a complete array of experimental systems that will allow us to focus on the lens and consequently answer a number of key questions relative to the lens itself and the world at large. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for watching this Royal Society video podcast.